2021. We have a great day ahead uh, for you all in the Rusty R Hall room. Um, first up, we'll be hearing from Curtis Miller, who is presenting uh, Overcoming the Limitations of POSEX Shell Command Language. Um, Curtis will be happy to take questions in the last five minutes of this session, so please post your questions, questions in Venulus. Um, you might see that there's a new uh, questions tab, so feel free to use that and we'll help moderate those questions at the end. Um, I'll now hand over to you, Curtis. Thanks, Ariana. Um, as Ariana said, this is Overcoming the Limitations of the POSIX Command Shell, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Eval. I'm Curtis Miller. I am a research engineer working for UNSW Sydney and as an affiliate with CSIRO's Data61. I work on the SEL4 microkernel and several systems that uh, interoperate with that. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Today I'm talking about POSIX and the POSIX command shell, and particularly some ways in which it is problematic. Um, most notably, it's approach to global variable scope. I'll also introduce some ways that we could use uh, the tools available within POSIX to resolve this, to introduce function scope and namespacing, as well as import the uh, collection of tools I have put together to make this actually usable. Um, and then I'll finish up with uh, an overview of some lessons learned in developing this and maybe evaluating when and when not this might be a good idea. So the POSIX command shell, or first up, POSIX itself. POSIX is an operating system interface standard. So it's a general standard on uh, an interface that an operating system provides that any software running on that operating system should expect to exist and behave in a certain way. It's distilled from a number of Unix derivatives uh, from the uh, at the point in the late 80s that they had all reached. It includes a C language API, so function bindings that need to exist for programs written in C or that are interoperable with C, um, FFI. File system layout requirements, the, existent, uh, the existence of certain directories and things within directories. The specification for the shell command language, the syntax and the um, semantics of that language and many other features of that interface exist. But the one I care about most today is the POSIX command shell language. It's a high level language specification. It exists to invoke other programs and applications within the operating system and allow them to communicate with each other and sequence them together. It lives uh, as a process at slash bin sh. Um, and for a, an operating system to be POSIX compliant, that process, uh, that application has to exist at that directory and has to uh, behave as described by the POSIX command shell specification. This language is often extended in other shells such as bash and ZSH and many others. Uh, but what I care about today is the uh, only the parts specified by the POSIX uh, standard. It's useful to have a high-level language as part of the operating system standard. Um, it's a language that uh, specifically, particularly one that is platform and architecture agnostic. So you don't have to have any foreknowledge of the underlying architecture um, being used to run the operating system. You merely need to know that the operating system provides this language, which you can then use to bootstrap um, many other processes on top of it. It has a known and reliable behavior. If you have a script that gets run on any POSIX system, if you're only relying on other parts of the POSIX uh, specification, it should operate the exact same way, no matter which variant of uh, POSIX, which actual implementation of the POSIX uh, interface you're using. You always know how to invoke it. You either have a script that starts with the shebang, or you pass it directly to the um, the application itself, which lives at bin sh. And it provides a nice standard way to run arbitrary code without knowing anything else about the operating system. It has many features. It has several features that um, are familiar to anyone who's looked at many other programming languages. You have variables, uh, control flows, such as loops, conditional branches. You have parameter expansion, which allows you to pass, essentially pass uh, variables um, as uh, arguments to other applications and functions. There's command substitution, which allows you to take the text output produced by a command or a function and uh, store that in a variable or pass it to another command. You can even define functions. So it has many features that are key to many different programming languages. As a few other special uh, uh, features such as token aliasing, arithmetic expansion. There are some string manipulation um, uh, features that it has, not all of which are always desirable, such as field splitting, path name expansion, quote removal. 
several other useful features that make that particularly suited for interacting with other uh, processes and applications and getting them to communicate with each other. One of the uh, more prominent ways that the Bash uh, that POSIX shell tends to be used is for co-distribution. So if you're distributing code that needs to run on a POSIX operating system, you can bootstrap that process of installing or getting that application running by running a shell and using that to inspect the uh, capabilities of the rest of the operating system. There are many other tools that call the POSIX shell or that depend on the semantics of the POSIX shell, basically anything that uses the system function provided by POSIX. Um, depends on the behavior of the POSIX command shell. So this is things like make or M4. Um, so essentially, anytime you have high level code that needs to run on an arbitrary operating system that you know implements this operating system interface, POSIX shell is the thing that you reach for first. And often that is used to bootstrap several, of, uh, several other things. So one of the particular, uh, I'd say, miss features of the POSIX command shell is that it has global variable scope. There is only one scope for variables. So if you have a variable with a particular name, uh, regardless of where that is executing inside a shell, within a particular shell, that name always refers to the same value. Um, if I create a new subshell, that gets copies of all the old values, but they can be changed without affecting the parent shell. And this weird dynamic means that it can be difficult to keep track of variables within shell scripts. Uh, you need to know basically every instance where a particular variable of a particular name is used, is depended upon, or is updated. Additionally, these variables can in, uh, overlap with environment variables. If a variable name is marked as export by the shell, then whatever value gets placed in there will be passed to child processes. So uh, let's start with a demo to quickly demonstrate um, a way in which this particular issue might manifest. Um, so if I cd to function, I have this uh, script here, which is install file. Uh, it just defines a, a few functions. So we have install this install file function, which um, takes an argument in the destination. It's going to create the directory, which is the destination, uh, which is the parent path of the destination. Then it's going to copy the source path to the destination path, and it will link it if it's on the same file system. So it's a nice, fairly efficient way to just put files in place from a source directory. We then have this install many function. It takes a source directory and a destination directory, and then a list of files within the source directory. And for every file within that source directory, it's going to uh, create the equivalent path in the destination directory and just call install file. Um, so if I look at my current directory, you can see we have this from directory and the files one, two, and uh, one, three, and two. I'm going to source install file. So that means I'm going to have those two functions available to me now. And then if I run install file and pass um, a file path to it, so I'm going to install from the file one to two to file two. If I tree again. If I tree again, we can see that it's installed that file. So everything's working as we expect so far. Um, so now let's try use install many. So I want to install all of these files from the fromda into a to directory. So I pass fromda as the source, tutor as the to directory, and then we're just going to install file one, two, and three. And what we get is some errors. So the first error we see is that it can't create the directory to the file one because that file exists, which is unexpected. And then we can't access the file to the file one, file two. And in the end, we're trying to access to the file one, file two, file three. In fact, if we tree, we can see that we've only managed to install that first file. And the reason this is an issue is if we look at install file and install many, they are reusing the same variable names here when we um, take those arguments. So install file is referring to source and destination. So every time we call install file, it sets source to its first argument. And down in install many, we're also using the variable source, which is the same variable because we don't have any scope. So source here is meant to be just a directory. 
um, and then we append each file name onto it. But every time we call install file, that changes source to be basically the value of this source file here. So we end up appending each file one after the other because of this variable reuse. And this is somewhat unexpected if you just read over the code um, and don't think too deeply about how these variables interact. And in fact, the same thing is also happening with the destination variable. So in order to resolve this particular issue, function scope would be quite desirable. Being able to have in, uh, independent calls to functions have their own copies of variables. So in order to implement function scope, we need to have some concept of a uh, variable context for a function. So whenever we call a function, we need to have some con concept of what which variables are available to that function and which names refer to those variables. So whenever we call a function, we need to create a new variable context. We need to make sure that only variables defined or declared in that function can be modified within that function. And then whenever we return from a function, we destroy that context of variables, that mapping of names to values. And we restore whatever variable context was in whatever call us. And this means that if we have even the same names for variables in different functions, whenever we call into a new function and start a new function, the names in that used in that function only refer to that function's variables. And so we can model this with a call stack, just as the, the same way many uh, programming languages would. And in order to do this, on function area, uh, entry, we just need to take a copy of all of the variables in the current context, figure out what has been defined, copy them somewhere where they aren't accessible, and then collect all of those names and push them onto a stack. And then we unset all of those variables. So whatever code starts executing after us now no longer has access to them. And then whenever we return from a function, we unset any variables that have been defined in that function, we pop the context off of the stack, and then we take a look at all of the variables that were in that context and fetch those values back. And a way to programmatically um, determine, uh, assign these variables to somewhere which is basically unaccessible is we're going to generate uh, variables that have a, a prefix that's basically reserved in this system. And we're having a, going to use a variable that's just going to track the depth of our call stack. So every time we call a function, we increment that depth. And every time we return from a function, we decrease that depth. Um, whenever we declare a variable, we track what that variable's declaration was. And then in order to save all of these variables, we just iterate through those variable names. We do this eval, which generates a name and assigns the current value of that variable. And then we unset that variable. The way this is going to look in our script um, is we're going to use a, a string as a list that's going to keep track of uh, the stack, our call stack, and what's in it. We're going to add a scope command that marks function entry. So every time we enter a function, we call this scope command. And this does the whole process of looking at the current variable context, saving it, and then clearing it. We use a var uh, command to declare variables to keep track of which variables have been declared. And then we will add scope return at the end of the function to clear out the current context and pop the old one off the stack. So let's take a look at what that might look like. Um, so if I cd into function scope. So this is the updated version of that script that we just, uh, sorry, this is a simplified version to uh, a simplified example to show what variable use might look like. So we have this show vars, which is just going to show in the current function what x, y, and z have been set to. And so this is what a function might look like. We have scope at the start. We declare and set some variables. We can uh, show the variables for function one, which is just going to print out x or undefined if it's not being set, and y and z. We then call function two, which declares its own scope, which calls function three a couple of times, shows its variables. And function three has var x. So what we should expect to see here is we call function one, we see that x and z are 12 and 14 and that y is not defined. When we call function two, we see x is 22 and y is 23 and uh, z is not defined. For function three, the only one that should be defined is x is equal to 32. And whenever we come back to function, we should see those variables return to what they were for that function. So, if I source that and then run func1, 
we can see that we actually get this. So in, whenever we have function one running, we can see that x is 12 and z is 14 at the start and at the end after having run, run everything. When we run function two, we have x equals 22 and y equals 23, and that's not defined. And whenever we return from function three, we can see that. And then multiple calls to function three reset those, va uh, those values. So that works as basically as we want. Um, and in fact, we can see how this is being tracked in the background. If I uncomment this. So if I source this again and call func1, we can, we're also going to take a look at the variables that have been set uh, outside. So in this sort of module scope prefix here, we can see one. So this is the depth I was talking about. We can see we have something that looks vaguely like a list here, which says X and Z have been declared. And then when we call into two, we can see that we have the scope here for, uh, for the X, um, the function one call stack frame and the variables that have been saved from that and the depth has been increased and the X and Y declarations from function two. And then when we call into function three, we can see function two's variables, function one's variables and the declaration for uh, function three. So if we now apply this to the example that we had before, this is what it might look like. So we have install file and we just add scope at the start, scope return at the end, and we use var to declare our variables. The same thing here, we have scope at the start, scope at the end, and var to declare our variables. Um, uh, these ones as well, but these lines are unchanged. They're, uh, they're identical, nothing has to change about them. So if I source that one now, and then I try and do the install many command as we had from before, we don't get any errors. And if I run tree, you can see that all of the files have been installed correctly. So that is how we can have function scope inside of the POSIX shell, which it doesn't itself natively support. Another thing that's particularly useful is modules, being able to encapsulate a, a set of things from our programming language that we can reuse in multiple cases elsewhere, um, but in a way that we don't have to worry about the way that those modules are implemented. Nothing aside from the public interface of those modules will leak out uh, into what we want into what we're trying to use. So what is a module uh, in a sort of technical sense? It's just a set of named items. We have names referring to variables that exist in the module, names referring to constants, and names referring to functions. And if I wanted to use some or all of this module, I could say, take this module and uh, add all of its contents or some subset of its contents to my current scope. And this might be inside of another module if I wanted to import um, all of the contents for that module into another one. Or it might even be in just a single function call for the duration of a single function, bring in some of those um, items from that module into that function's scope. Another thing that's quite useful uh, and that we would like to do generally by default is that functions from a module when they're executed also have the rest of that module in scope. So a function can see everything that was defined in the same module as it was. In order to model modules, we need to sort of grapple with the idea of the way shell works because this is all still being implemented on top of shell uh, using POSIX shell itself. Uh, and so if we want to include a module, we need to have something that executes, but that doesn't modify the actual current state yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that a module is a result of some script. So when the script finishes executing, all of the items from that module are now defined and that module itself is now defined, but it, it hasn't been introduced to any scope yet. And then once that module has been defined, we can select parts of it in any scope that gets generated after that to be included into it. And for convenience, we want to be able to nest the, the, the creation of modules. We don't want to be tr trying to set up modules ahead of time because that's uh, somewhat wasteful and slow. Um, it's preferable to do it lazily. So what we want is for whenever a module needs to be loaded by a function or another module, that's the point where we decide to initialize it. And if that happens during another module, we need to keep track of what module was being initialized uh, before we started initializing this one. And for that, 
um, we're going to use a stack to track which modules are being constructed. And as we introduce new modules to be constructed as ones are already being constructed, they just get pushed onto the stack. And once this is all done, we'll have a way to map from module names and items in their scope to the actual underlying variables, constants, and functions. Um, Defining variables and constants in the scope of a module is very similar to defining variables and constants within the scope of a function. Uh, you just need to track the name and the value and copy the values around. For constants, uh, you would copy the value, the constant value into the scope that it's being added to rather than uh, allow that reference to be modified um, globally. For functions, however, we can't really treat them as values in the same way that we could in other languages. We need some way of having the name of a function being added to a scope to still refer to the original function. We can do that in POSIX shell with aliases. And what I have on screen here is a programmatic way to generate these aliases. And in fact, what we do is we generate the alias before defining it. Um, this allows us to declare that a function is about to be declared to define the uh, declare the function and have that name both in the module and everything that refers to it refer to the same underlying function. And I'll just give a quick demonstration of what I mean here. So if I have a function that I want to declare, uh, an alias for a function I want to declare, such as say foo is equal to bar. So foo is the public name for this function and bar might be the private name. I can now define foo as this function. So if I execute foo, I get this as foo. But because of that alias, if we look at foo, foo is still not a function. It's still an alias for bar. And that means that bar was defined as foo. So this allows us to have these hidden uh, global names that people don't refer to, in this case, instead of bar but to have aliases generate, generated whenever we need to actually manually uh, refer to that function. Um, this isn't supported in all shells, uh, only ones that are strictly POSIX compliant. So as for the interface we're going to get to set up these modules, we have a list as a stack of modules in the same way that we had a call stack for functions. We're going to add this module command that we put at the start of a script that defines a, mo uh, a module to mark that it's been created and what name to give it. We track variables with var. Const is like var, but it doesn't allow you to modify the variable inside the module. And we add fun to track function declarations. We also have end module at the end of a module to mark when it's be finished being declared to pop that module off the stack and go back to the execution of the script that was defining whatever called it. And then whenever we want to use uh, items from that module or the module itself, after its definition, we have, uh, we've added a use command. So you can specify that module or the module and some of its children to add to the scope that you're currently executing in. So let's take a look at how this works. So I have a simple module defined here. It's called module color. Um, it's got the public constant bold. This is a private constant, so you can't uh, import it externally, but it exists within this module. We have red and cyan as colors defined here. We have this unstyle function, which is private, so this can't be used outside the module. And we have this public function span, which lets us style a span of text. And then we end the module down here. So if we look at the current state of our module system. We have this global module, which is what's currently being defined, and it has no declarations yet. And we have a scope depth of zero, and there's nothing in the stack. And that's just where the state's being logged. Now, if I run the script color.sh, this is going to define that module, but it's not going to introduce anything into our namespace yet. So if I mod vars, so we can see that we have um, these variables have been created. We have this, which defines all of the declarations of module. We have the public constant bold, the private constant FG base, public constant red, public constant cyan, the private function on style, and the public function span. But there is still nothing in our global namespace. So now if I were to try and refer to any of those variables, because they haven't been introduced, 
cyan doesn't exist. If I try and refer to red, it doesn't exist. So this module has been defined, but it, it's not been imported anywhere. So we need to do that explicitly now after running that script. So I'm going to use the module color using span and function cyan. And what the using here means is that rather than prefixing span or cyan with color, I can just refer to those names directly. So if I look at mod vars now, our global namespace has just gotten a bunch of declarations for these imported values, and it now has copies of the constants. So now I can do things like refer to span and cyan because I imported them. This is cyan. Um, if I try and do the same thing with red, because red was not imported directly, I still can't use that name. What I can do is refer to it by a sort of full name. So I get color FG red. And in fact, I can do that with span and cyan as well. Those names are also added. And so this is how we get modules. We have this concept of an, a script that defines a module that has its own internal state that we can't interact with and has some uh, exported interface that we can access, some variables and constants it's defining, some functions it's defining that we can call. And we can pick some subset of that to use elsewhere in our scripts. And we don't have to care about the way its functions are implemented, what its private variables are called, because we can't modify them. There's no way we can change them, and there's no way it changes those are going to affect any code we run. We can use those modules without having to worry about how variables are manipulated in those modules. So I've packaged all of this up into a, uh, a, a set of tools called import. So it has this function scoping that I've been demonstrating. It has POSIX shell modules that I've been demonstrating. It also has a mechanism for resolving module names and loading them. So instead of using use, you use import, and that will find a copy of the script either on your local file system if you initialize it that way, or if you use the remote initialization version, it will search the GitHub repository for a copy of that module, initialize that module, and then import whatever you've requested. This allows you to have some sort of remote module store or a local version. Um, this is how you would initialize a remote version. It's a bit uh, complicated, but we just check that we don't already have an import system set up, which is what this function does. Um, and then we create a temporary file to store the uh, import script. We download the import script, and then we initialize it with these lines, and then we remove it. But this means that whatever shell executed that import script now has it sitting in memory, as do all of the shells that it creates during execution. For the local version, you just keep a local copy of the repository somewhere, and you set that as your import script, and you initialize it. So this is what the color module would look like for um, uh, within import, or our basic version of the color module. And it looks much like what I just showed recently. Um, so let's take a look at how import works. Um, so if I cd into import, all I have is this main. So if we look at that, this is just going to use the local copy of import, which is this, uh, these slides are actually inside of the import repository. Uh, so it just uses the local version and it initializes it. And then instead of using our smaller version of color that we defined earlier, this is using the full color library that comes out of, um, that's already in the import system. So we're going to use span, style, unstyle. We have a few foreground colors and a few um, text styles that we can use here. And we're just going to define a main function and call it once the script is evaluated. Um, and it's just going to print some pretty text. So we're going to get this text is red in red and italic. We're going to get this text is in cyan, aesthetic, and italic bold yellow, and some regular ex uh, cyan exclamation marks. So let's run it and see what happens. Another thing to note, though, is that this is all using dash. This is because bash and zsh don't comply with the standard strictly enough. Um, so if I just run main.sh now, 
you can see that it's a bit slow. But it does eventually print out that text. Um, and so that sort of leads me into some of the issues with import. So whilst the syntax that I've managed to add here, I feel is fairly ergonomic uh, and makes this a lot more convenient to use, there are a number of issues with this system. None of this code that is being used is signed, so it should be audited to some degree. That said, it's only shell scripts that aren't very large, so maybe auditing isn't a big issue if you ever plan on using this realistically. But the overheads this system adds, because it's all implemented in POSIX shell, are quite substantial. It takes a lot of time to uh, set up and copy all of these variables around the shells, uh, especially when you end up with quite a large con uh, state uh, for all of the constants and variables and functions that you're keeping track of. And additionally, this requires strict POSIX compliant to the degree that Bash and ZSH can't don't support this. Um, Bash has issues with name resolution, and ZSH will explicitly prevent you from alias uh, defining functions using via alias names. It tells you that it doesn't like you doing that. So this maybe not may, probably isn't the the biggest thing that I would recommend you actually using. It's more of a uh, this was more of a an exploration into what could be done with POSIX and where the logical boundaries of using POSIX shell might be. So having a high level language is very useful as an OS interface, but this particular language scales very poorly. It doesn't deal with uh, highly modular or reused code. So uh, as it requires you to keep track of all of these this variable state everywhere. And this means that if you're ma uh, maintaining shell scripts, especially shell scripts that rely on other shell scripts, they can break quite easily. So my main recommendation would be rather than using import, which was uh, a fun tool to put together, it's probably best to try and make the minimal use of shell that you can. And in some cases, this is very difficult to do, particularly if you're relying on systems like make, which make quite heavy use of POSIX shell. And with that, I hope you all found something useful in this talk, and I'm happy to accept questions. That is great. What a fantastic and interactive presentation. A bit over my head at times, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so we have some questions from the audience. Uh, first up, um, so the first question coming is, uh, why not use subshells instead of manually creating a scope command? And also, an add-on to that, every shell I know of that isn't running in strict uh, POSIX mode has a local key, a keyword. Yeah, so using um, scopes is a valid way of um, effectively having some sort of function scope, uh, but it doesn't really help if you're trying to maintain um, variables outside the lifetime of a function in something like a reusable module. Um, so. It's not in, so it, it can help in a large number of cases. It also adds its own overhead by duplicating subshells. Um, and that can be implemented with some level of optimization by your shell implementation. So that's probably a, a far easier thing to do and a far nicer thing to rely on. As I said, what I was trying to demonstrate here wasn't necessarily what should be done, but what can be done with the POSIX standard itself and maybe where that standard itself is lacking. So in addition, where you mentioned that every shell you know of that isn't strict uh, in strict POSIX compliance has a local keyword that works mostly the same across those shells that use them. But once again, if you're using relying on POSIX shell, you're probably trying to target uh, software distribution perhaps, and you can't rely on the existence of, other, of those other shells. If you're simply trying to target something and all you want to rely on is that POSIX interface, you can't rely on things like the local keyword extension that Bash and ZSH and many others provide. Um, yeah. So once again, it's a matter of what tools you realistically can rely on you on having available to you. OK. Let's, so next up, we have a question. Um, is the scope stack always safe in case the variables contain special characters? That's an excellent question. So the POSIX standard actually restricts what characters can be used for variable names, such that the mechanism I've described here, if you're using strict, uh, strictly POSIX shell, should work in all cases, because it's only ever going to concatenate variables with other names. 
uh, with it's only go, ever going to concatenate safe variable names with other safe variable names. Although it's possible that in some perverse cases, you'll end up with collisions between valid variable names inside of a module and the hidden variable names that it's creating. Mm. OK. So um, what happens if your imported module script crashes before the normal end module? Aren't you then stuck with objects in the global scope or worse objects from global pushed into a stack oblivion? <laughs> yeah, this was something that I had to deal with as I was constructing this, this toy. Um, it can happen, though, if your module crashes pop, I wouldn't suggest trying to use this interactively. If you did use this system interactively, those are the sort of issues you come across. If you weren't using it interactively, then ideally the entire thing should crash. Um, you shouldn't be left with too much external to the script that's relying on these modules from having broken. Would I recommend any shell check utilities? Sorry. Yeah, that's up next. Um, Do you recommend any shell check utilities? Yeah, so I would definitely recommend if you're writing shell code that is being distributed to downstream users that you expect to use it without making big assumptions on what they have available to them, specifically if you want to limit yourself to that POSIX interface, then you should really be using shell checkers that check you aren't using things like bashisms, things that would work in bash, but if you're not explicitly targeting bash, may fail in any other uh, POSIX, in any other shell that's only running in a way that supports POSIX. Um, I don't know any of those off the top of my head because all of the ones that we use where I work are in our CI and I don't have to think about them. Okay. Um, and also just a reminder to everyone that Curtis will be available to take questions in the um, Rusty R Hall post talk Q&A channel on Venulus. So you might be able to ask him some more curly questions there. Um, I do have another one that's um, a little bit sort of off topic, but thought it might sure. be relevant. Um, it's about your slides. Um, what tools? What tool are you using for these slides, Curtis? One avid attendee so I'm would a like fan to of know. Tweeting. These slides are written using import. So the links for the slides should be on the screen now. If we can flash that up. So the slides are at this link. Um, that should be the Git ref for the specific version that you've been seeing today. The old project can be found at GitHub at Curtis slash import. Um, but I can show you, uh, the slides are literally just a shell script. So I import, set up import, and then I set, uh, import a slides module that's there that you can look at. I import the color module and then each slide is just a call to a slide command. And at the end, I just have a present command. But you can go look at all of the, uh, the, the script that generates these slides uh, on that, in that GitHub repository. That's awesome. OK, questions are coming fast. So if one uses um, read only, does that conflict with temporarily expunging the set of visible variables? Um, so. Uh, I think read only is a bashism. So there is a private qualifier you can stick on. So you, in modules, names in modules can be either public or private, and that just um, changes whether or not, sorry, there is const variables in modules, which rather than being uh, a duplicate, uh, rather than being an alias to another variable in a module. So when you import that and you modify that, and then that variable goes out of scope, it gets copied back to the module. Consts only copy it in one direction. So it is still possible for um, for changes to those constant variables to actually uh, persist throughout whichever scope they were imported into. Um, but because this is just using normal shell variables, anytime you do import a variable from another module or a name from another module, that's going to overwrite whatever had that name currently in the scope. And where do you see your work going next? What would you what are you excited on working on next in this area or others? So this was just something I spent my uh, was doing in my spare time. I was getting frustrated at not being able to reuse code in POSIX shell 
sorry, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I was being frustrated not being able to easily reuse code in POSIX shell, so I wanted to see what I could do to alleviate that without having to rely on anything outside of the POSIX standard. It's not something that I would use practically or something that I would, I, I would apply to the work I do with um, SCL4. OK, yeah. That's great. OK. Um, uh, we're a little bit ahead of time, but as I said, we can keep the discussion going on Venulus in the Rusty mm -hmm. R post talk Q&A room. I'd love to really thank you for coming in. That was a really great presentation. I certainly learnt a lot and have a lot to go with um, in the future. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference, Curtis. Um, thanks, thanks, everybody, for attending. Nice. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, we're going to have a 10 minute break now. Uh, we're, well, probably more like a 15 minute break. And we're back at 11.40, where we'll be listening to Katie Bell, who's presenting What Even Is Code? Building a Non-Code Coding Interface. So that looks great as well. Thanks again, Curtis. And uh, we'll hopefully have a good conference for the rest of the day. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. You too.